Métis Week is a traditional time of reflection for the Métis people of northeastern Alberta. A time for music, dancing, and feasting in celebration of a rich heritage. But on this particular occasion, something more is taking place. The Métis Nation of Alberta is presenting plaques in honor of the founders of Portage College. Who are the people receiving these plaques? And why is this acknowledgement so important? The answer takes us back almost 40 years to a time when a dream was realized. A dream that would have died all too soon had it not been for a group of selfless individuals. Before New Start, we had a, a very high rate of uh, dropouts in uh, school. And this is one step that uh, the people look for to have a school where they can attend the, the school and yet still live in the, in the premises like that. The idea of New Start was to put uh, well-equipped trailers on, in a settlement like Kikino, John Vie and Fort Chippewyan. The staff running those trailers were either machinists, mechanics, cook, the, the wives or the cooks. And what they did was they hired 20 families and those 20 families would get up in the morning and arrive there at seven o'clock, make breakfast for their family, and then the kids would go to school. And during the day, there'd be women teachers there, whatever, instructors with the women, and the men instructors with the men. Everybody was a teacher, everybody was a learner. Carpentry, at that time, they needed carpenters. So, and upgrading to further educate the adults, and bricklaying, well it's called masonry now, but it was bricklaying course at that time. And that's where, what it was all about, is to help out the Métis and the Aboriginal people to get ahead. In them days too, there was hardly any jobs. And what job you got, you didn't get very much. You didn't get paid very much for it. So this was a start for them. Beginning in 1967, Alberta New Start programs were opened in Fort Chippewan, Fort McMurray, Janvier, Kikino, and Lac La Biche, which was also the administrative head office for Northern Alberta. The educational opportunities provided by New Start were much needed and highly valued by the Aboriginal people of this region. But all too soon, hope for a better life began to recede. The federal government decided that so many New Start training centers were too costly. The Lac La Biche New Start Center was shut down in December of 1969. It just went from word of mouth. It spread so fast. That's when the people came into play. Uh, we had uh, ex-workers of uh, Alberta New Start at that time informing us what was about to take place. A complete shock one day. But they were closing the Alberta New Start down. And from what my grandma told me, she said that they actually used, used chains to lock the doors. Yeah. They did, so nobody could get in, and they locked everything up. With William Erasmus, Raymond Harp, Veronica, all those, and young Lauren Spence and that, what we had to do was get them to take a stand, because uh, if you don't take a stand, who cares, you know? Because it makes so much sense. What, the government should know that the school should be there. So you have to convince them that the government doesn't give a damn, you know? Nobody was listening. And they wanted somebody that could speak on behalf of them. And so uh, we, we looked around who would be the best spokesman who, uh, who knew how to look cabinet minister in the eye and say, you're doing the wrong thing. And uh, William Erasmus' name came up. The people were determined that the center be reopened and that training, housing, and other development opportunities be returned to them. They held a series of meetings beginning at Kikino and Caslin to talk about the best course of action. After much discussion, it was decided that the people needed to hold a demonstration large enough to attract the attention of government leaders. And then they had a meeting there and then they come for my husband. 
So he came down. I didn't know what was going on. But he came back and he told me that uh, 80 people broke into the Albert and New Start. William said that he was given the call first thing in the morning and he had no idea because he was busy, he said. And then he said that my cookum was called Veronica Morin, uh, Lawrence Spence, and Raymond Harp. They were all to speak on behalf of the people. The sit-in would last 26 days and include upwards of 250 people. It has to be well organized. And so you're, you go to a family and explain to them, or three, four families together, and say, this is what's happening. Uh, can you give a, a week or two weeks of your time to sit in because you don't know how long it's going to stretch out? Now, they have cattle or horses or stuff to look after if they're farmers. Um, who can go? Well, I can go, I can go, Grandma can go, this, you know. Okay, starting on this time there, come in, walk in. Don't ask for permission, just walk in. If, if, so everybody has a time to arrive. Everybody knows they have to bring sleeping bags, have to bring some utensils to drink water and eat with. Uh, Everybody has to know what they're doing. When we did occupy the school, we uh, we weren't up to date on uh, how you conduct these meetings and uh, and all that. And, and this is where Mr. Erasmus came into uh, to the picture. They weren't going to have their way with the Métis people. There's no way. He said they were going to open that school and have school going in there for the people because that's what the school was there for. Why try to close it on the, on the people? Because you know, that was a great thing for them. There was jobs there for them. There was school there for them. Everything was there for them. But somehow or another, they got that door open and inside they went. <laughs> it was all people. It wasn't about the counselors and the community and uh, the store owners and stuff like that because like my cookum said, they, they, didn't, they didn't back them. It was all about the people. It was a lot of people to move in and we wanted grandmothers and children so that if a police comes to remove them, the media and the churches and stuff get very angry if you see them grab a grandmother. Some of my kids slept on the floor and some of us slept on the beds. But we were determined to, to stay there till they get what they wanted. I went to a lot of uh, meetings where my dad went. And my dad, he could speak. Like he did a lot of, uh, in the courthouse, he interpreted, yeah, for, uh, <laughs> for some of the native people, right, because they couldn't speak English. His family extended out and pretty much he sacrificed a lot of things at home just to open the doors for everybody else. Sometimes I didn't know when I was going to see him. <laughs> he was gone. Meetings, meetings, meetings. As the sit-in grew in numbers, the media began to take an interest, most of it favorable to the people. Newspaper and television reporters started to ask uncomfortable questions of government officials. It became clear that the community, too, needed spokespeople for their cause. We had a very good relationships with uh, with the media, uh, Edmonton Journal, uh, CFRN TV, CBC. So this wasn't just an isolated uh, news; it was pr uh, across the country. Eh? Well, Raymond Harp was the elected leader of the Métis people in Lac La Biche, and uh, Raymond was liked, well liked, and was kind of a gung ho guy. Um, and he was a good part. When we start drawing people in, like William Erasmus was spokesman, the young Lawrence Spence was a young guy at that time. It just showed a youth. He represented young people that needed a break in life. William was mentioned that he, he should be invited if he would participate with the people as one of the lead spokesmen. And uh, I'm honored to say that he accepted that position and I was more or less his sidekick more than anything else. Uh, and Mrs. Morin uh, was one of the 
leading spokesman uh, on, on that issue, the issue on, on her part, if I remember correctly, is education, right? The golden key to open any door or any opportunity and for a better lifestyle would be education. Because she, back in the day she graduated, was at grade eight, she could speak four different languages. And then she thought, okay, well, if this is good enough for me, I'm going to teach the same value to my children and my children's children. And that's why I believe that belief and that value of education still stands. We had people from, uh, I believe, St. Paul, mm -hmm. Saddle Lake, Coal Lake, uh, all over the place. Kikino, Caslin. Uh, Caslin is uh, Buffalo Lake now, I think. Um, Mission, um, Lac La Biche for sure, Métis and Lac La Biche. Uh, there was rumors flying that uh, at, at, at one stage that uh, the RCMP were ready and to come in and uh, ev evict everybody or throw everybody in jail. And uh, William uh, came up and says, well, he says, if they want to throw 250 people in jail, you know, where if they take one, they'll take all of us, mm -hmm. right. They didn't want it to be made out to be something violent exactly. and disorganized. They wanted to show the people how people are going to come together, use communication, problem solve as a team. And all these people work together as a team. We had meetings uh, day in and day out. As soon as there was something not uh, functioning right, uh, our job was to make sure that everything runs smoothly. The people that were involved in the sit-in, they all had a say in everything that was going on there. Everything was kept neat, tidy, uh, security reasons, there was no uh, alcohol or booze allowed in the, the premises and stuff like that. The people were steadfast in their determination to have the school reopened. The town council and people of Lac La Biche decided to support the sit-in, a decision that was both political and economic. Still. The protesters knew that not everyone was in favor of their actions. There was, every issue was pretty well down the drain here. Uh, uh, housing, uh, there was a lot of uh, discrimination going on. And even during the sit-in, we had quite a bit of that going on. As the weeks passed with no real resolution coming from either the Alberta or Canadian government, the people began to talk about sending a committee to Ottawa to negotiate an agreement. Twelve people were picked out very quickly by each other. I'd like to go, no, I don't think you should go, I think he should go, you know, it was all done. And then the worst part came when they said only four. Well, geez, you have to, you know, they had to figure out which uh, eight couldn't go. I think Lawrence went, if I'm not mistaken, because they wanted a youth there. This is why we're fighting for the school. He was a good-looking, handsome young guy. When we got to Ottawa, we were met by uh, more media. Uh, William was interviewed, I was interviewed, and I believe Mrs. Morin was interviewed. And uh, we were checked into Lord Elgin, I believe at that time, Lord Elgin Mot uh, Hotel across from the House of Commons was they needed people that were strong, selfless, uh, had discipline, and were there for the main reason, and that was the people. Williams' meetings, I think, really shook the government because he was right on, he never wavered, he was polite. It, it was a professional uh, uh, meeting. One of the aides came and got William from the, from the table, and they went, and William came back, and... He says, I wonder what these people are trying to pull. Well, they asked, they offered him $10,000, right, to sell out his people. And my dad said, no, I'm not that kind of a man. Mm -hmm. To him, his people are his people, and he would not sell it. They thought that maybe he was that kind of man that could be bribed and told to go home. But when he told me, he said, no, I'm not that kind of man. That stated to that bureaucrat was his words, Bureau, damn bureaucrat, he said, I, I'm not that kind of man, and I'm here for the people. And that basically spoke out loud and clear.
because he did tell my cookum, and then my cookum said, yes, William was bribed almost $10,000 to keep his mouth shut and go home. But he was there for the people. Yeah, because my dad, his goal is you go out there, you get your education, you better yourself, you know. They never settled for anything what the government wanted. It's what they wanted, and, they, and the government couldn't mm -hmm. compromise with them or nothing. It's exactly what they wanted. Working with these people, Mr. Erasmus, Mrs. Morin, Mr. Harp, and the people involved, that was quite an experience I'll never forget. In the end, the people were successful in negotiating funding for two years of operation, after which they would be on their own. The community elected a board of directors for the new training center, and Alberta Petapan Development Incorporated was born. See, Petapan is a Cree name. It was actually given by Adrian Hope from Kikino, one of the oldest elders that we had there in Kikino. They wanted him to have a name for Petapan. He said, well, New Dawn, he said, people finally woke up. He said, let's call it New Dawn. That's Petapan. This college is still here because it did have a purpose, and the purpose was education, and not just for the people in this family or my family, but for everybody in the surrounding areas. That's why it works, because they had a dream. Education is uh, the most important thing in life, and uh, you take that away from the people. If they care anything about their families, their children, they will fight for what they believe in, and, and this is, what happened here. But the door always has to be open, you can never close it. And that's kind of like what my grandpa did. You know, when he got involved is, instead of arguing to open the door, he basically just kicked the door open. Everybody else has the same opportunity as me. And that's kind of what he, he stood for. Everybody was striving to have something better. They wanted something better for their people. That's why this, this event happened, and it was just something that happened so quickly, she said, how everybody just pulled together. She said, I was amazed. They had a place for kids to be looked after, if you have kids, so you could get an education. And that's kind of what my grandfather wanted, and probably everybody else when they first started this this school was to make sure everybody had what they need to succeed. Grade 12 is not the end, so this is where they come into the college and the college, uh, they, they put their mind to it, they get back on their feet. They have good jobs and they're doing better for themselves and their kids are well off and their standard of living has improved, their quality of <coughs> life has improved, so as far as I'm concerned, the school has has done what it's supposed to do. What began as an Alberta New Start Training Center in 1968 is today Portage College, which enjoys the solid support of the provincial government and is proud of the quality and reach of educational opportunities we can now offer. While Portage College continues to grow to meet the ever-changing needs of Northern Alberta, its priority is, and will always be, the development of knowledgeable, skilled citizens in a caring, nurturing, and supportive learning environment. The people really needed the building mm -hmm. and really needed the schools to be opened. So this way, I think it was a good thing. Because now today it's still, it's still here. Actually with a different name, I can't get used to the name. <laughs> It's still, it's still Alberta New Start to me. For me, to be sitting here, I feel honored that I did take a part in the sit-in and where it is today. Had we not taken that stand at the time that the people took, I wonder where the college would have been today. This is so spiritual. It's like someone up there is still looking down here, not only like the her generation but the next generation and next generation so in, in a way their purpose their dream their value their their belief is still living on in this school every day
Thank <laughs> you.